On This Week in Enterprise Tech, Mo Data, Mo Money, Why Your Financial Should Be in the Cloud, and Spectrum Wars, everything you need to know for freedom. Twyant on the set. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for This Week in Enterprise Tech is provided by CashFly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Twyant. This Week in Enterprise Tech, episode 146, recorded June 26, 2015. Spectrum Wars for Freedom. Welcome to Twyat This Week in Enterprise Tech. It's the show dedicated to the enterprise professional, the IT pro, and the geek who just wants to know how the world is connected. I'm your host, Father Robert Ballas, here, the digital Jesuit, your guide to all things in the enterprise. But of course, I'm not guiding you by myself. I'm joined by my regular cast of characters and cohorts. My good friend, starting with Mr. Brian Chi, the director of the Advanced Network Computing Laboratory in Honolulu, Hawaii, who is right now parked to, next to a 15-foot-tall cricket. Is that what's going on there, Chibert? Oh, yeah. Don't we just love it? Yeah, it's <laughs> No, they're, um, they're actually trying to make sure that we're safe and that we can actually hear the freaking fire alarm. And uh, the crickets that you're hearing every once in a while is actually the fire alarm annunciator on the other side of the building. So I'm assuming that as we get closer to the important stories of the show, those alarms are going to get closer to you. Yes, you know it's loud when the contractor is handing out earplugs to the people coming into the building. Good, good. Uh, we, we look forward to this. Now, uh, someone who doesn't need earplugs is Mr. Curtis Franklin from Information Week Radio. Curtis, how are things on the other side of the United States? Well, we're well and truly into the rainy season here in Florida. We're getting... Uh, couple of inches a day, and that's fine because it keeps the temperature down and makes it a perfect set of weather events to stay inside and do quiet. Absolutely. Staying inside and doing quiet, really, that's the story of my life. Speaking of doing quiet, let's go ahead and jump straight in to the blips. This first one is all about T-Mobile wanting to educate you about Spectrum so you can get mad at the FCC. Now, last week, John Laguerre, the CEO of T-Mobile, released a series of YouTube videos aimed at waking you up to the realities of wireless spectrum as he sees them. Namely, that T-Mobile needs more spectrum and the FCC isn't accommodating the uncarrier. Specifically, he's upset about the scheduled auction of roughly 80 megahertz of frequencies in the 600 megahertz band in the first quarter of 2016. Now, those frequencies are extremely good at traveling long distance and through walls, making it prime real estate in the wireless market. The problem, as Laguer sees it, is that the current rules allocate 30 megahertz of that auction for carriers that don't already have large chunks of premium spectrum. In effect, that leaves 50 megahertz for AT&T and Verizon. However, as AT&T and Verizon already own three quarters of the available low bandwidth frequencies, T-Mobile wants half of the auction to be protected from larger carriers. Of course, doing that would essentially rob the FCC of many more billions in revenue that they could get from AT&T and Verizon, but Laguerre argues that the wireless affirmative action must take place if we want more than just two wireless carriers ruling the airwaves. Microsoft lives on Android phones. Microsoft has announced the general availability of Word, PowerPoint, and Excel across Android smartphones, availability that comes after a five-week preview period. During the preview, Office apps were tested on more than 1,900 Android smartphone models across 83 countries. The Android-compatible editions of Word, Excel, and PowerPoint were designed to pack familiar features of Office in a more compact device. For example, navigation and menu options are at the bottom of the screen to eliminate hassle in reviewing and editing documents. Android tablets got the full version of Office in January after a three-month preview period that generated more than 250,000 downloads of Word, PowerPoint, and Excel across 500 different tablet models. The OPM director says they're trying very hard. Yeah. In what is clearly a face-saving attempt, Catherine Archer Lua is kicking the spin factory into high gear, saying that they're trying very hard to deal with this massive breach. However, security industry pundits are reporting that OPM's efforts are confused and at times conflicting with each other and seems to be lacking any clear leadership. 
What was revealed was that the breach started with stolen credentials from a security auditing firm, which was then used to gain access to the Epic background investigation system. Little birds have told me that some of the efforts are a slap in the face of federal employees when it was noted that the personnel records fix is being handled by a firm out of India. Ms. Archeluda is defending herself by saying that upon her arrival, that she kicked off a comprehensive plan of revamping the OPM security systems. But I would still like to point out that the bad guys were in the OPM system for over a year and that even if they had implemented off-the-shelf systems, that they would have been able to detect the breach quickly, just like the National Archives. Hey, who needs hackers when government employees are using their supposedly ultra-sensitive, ultra-secure logins on ultra-insecure sites? This past Wednesday, Recorded Future, a security intelligence firm, released a report that details how they found a mass of online email addresses and passwords for government employees in public internet dumps. Among the more interesting bits, they found the login information of 224 government staffers from 12 federal agencies on Pastebin. Uh, one might think that such high-profile data would at least be found only on the darknet, but appears that the government employees using their secure credentials on non-government sites is such a common occurrence that it's almost dispensable, disposable. Even more troubling than bad identity hygiene from government employees is the fact that most federal agencies allow for high-privileged logins without as much as two-factor authentication. More and more, it looks like hackers don't need an advanced persistent threat to break into government systems. They just need to guess a staffer's Facebook login. Lenovo Idea Center Stick is a $129 PC in your hand. Lenovo is rolling out the company's first compute stick, the Idea Center Stick 300. The $129 stick transforms almost any HDMI compatible TV or monitor into a Windows based PC. The device boasts an Intel Bay Trial Atom processor, 2 gigs of memory, and 32 gigs of storage. It initially ships with Windows 8.1, but will be eligible for a free upgrade to Windows 10 starting in late July. All of this is packed into a case that measures just, oh, about four inches wide, one and a half inches deep, and a little over half an inch high. Lenovo joins Intel, Google, Arcos, and other vendors in offering a tiny, bare-bone stick format computer. Now, where might these be used? Lenovo executives point to emerging markets as logical targets for these units, markets where television vastly outnumbers computers and smart mobile devices. Now, if we can just train a Labrador retriever to bring us one of these sticks in exchange for a treat. Well, I mentioned the National Archives, and the National Archive found the exact same exploits that OPM got hit with. In what is being called a false positive, the National Archives malware detection system found malware with a signature similar to what was used in the OPM breach, but they found it before it could be exploited. Maybe OPM should take a lesson from the National Archives especially since I would imagine that the National Archives didn't spend anywhere near what OPM says they spent and yet found the potential breach with commercial off-the-shelf systems. Hey, do you remember when Lenovo loaded Superfish on their notebook computers in order to provide a better customer experience to support uh, their customers? Well, in the process, they exposed their users to a host of exploits. Now, do you remember how much their customers enjoyed that? No. Well, Samsung does, because they've done the exact same thing with their PCs. Patrick Baker, a Microsoft MVV MVP, discovered that Samsung PCs have a program named Disable Windows Update.exe that runs every time the PCs boot. Well, the problem, as you may have guessed from the name, is that it disables Windows Update. The reason? Well, it seems that Samsung likes to use parts that don't work well with the standard Windows driver library. Microsoft updates tend to break their, their drivers, so instead of fixing their hardware or working with Microsoft, the Korean company decided that their customers don't need those pesky critical Windows updates. Baker identified Samsung's implementation of USB 3 as a potential culprit for the brute force disabling of updates. But hey, even though your Windows installation is vulnerable to every exploit since it came out of the box, at least you'll be able to quickly transfer infected files. That does it for the blips. Let's go ahead and jump into the Enterprise Bites. This first one is all about gambling, casinos, specifically casinos in big data. Uh, we've been talking about big data here on Twiat ever since episode one, but it seems like it's really making the transition from something that's theoretical and academic to something 
that is being used more and more in everyday business analytics. Now, specifically, this is an article from CA. They released this article. It's really just a press release. It's an advertisement for their services, but it actually does contain some very interesting information. Specifically, they looked at MGM casinos. That includes the MGM Grand, the Bellagio, New York, New York, and some of their other casino properties. Now, the company has a three-person team running big data analytics to look at 25,000 slot machines that accounted for $6 billion in revenue in 2013. Now, this, this team, this three-person team, is responsible for optimizing those slots using the analytical data that they get back from their big data analysis. Now, they have used that big data to identify slot performance trends across MGM's properties, correlate game selection, location, and hold to the trends that they've identified, create heat maps of casino floors to predict revenue stream interaction, and this is my personal favorite, this wasn't specifically mentioned in the article, but it is mentioned in the study that they are able to identify the pain threshold of slot players using a variety of, of information bits that they get from everything from how the machine is being played to where that customer is seated to how many drinks that they order. They can find out if a customer is ready to walk away from the machine and they can have the machine pay off in order to keep them gambling. This is all possible because of the way that they're using big data analytics. I want to throw this over to you first, Curtis. This is one of those things that was promised, that it will allow companies to act more efficiently. But this this kind of, it almost feels skeevy, right? There's Is there something wrong with this particular use of big data? Well, to me, there's no problem with their use of the data. Where I have the problem is in the use of the term big data. Because to me, big data implies not just a large data set, but a particular type of data. In other words, unstructured, multifaceted data types put into a single pool and analyzed using some key tools. What they're doing is more or less straightforward, classic analysis just on some pretty whopping large data sets. Um, I'm not surprised, by the way, about a year and a half ago, I did uh, some interviews with the CTO of the company, and he was very forward-looking about how they were going to use mobile devices, how they were going to use location uh, information, uh, you know, geo-tracking. So this kind of analysis for the MGM Corporation doesn't surprise me in the slightest. Um, I'm a little bit curious about their terminology, but one of the things that this proves is just how powerful an analytical tool Excel has become. And I think that may be sort of uh, the burying the lead part of the story. Exactly. Uh, that, that was going to be the next part, which is, when we think of big data, and actually, uh, could you go back to Curtis? Because Curtis has to do his, his typical Hadoop thing. We think of Hadoop because Hadoop, Hadoop is... Hadoop, 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 There we go. Exactly. Hadoop has been the de facto big data tool. That's that's the one that everyone talks about. But this, this casino is doing big data analytics with Excel and SQL. That's not supposed to be... In, in fact, that almost doesn't meet the definition of big data. We've had big data experts on the show, and they say big data sets dispersed data sets using tools that you wouldn't traditionally use. Chebert, is this still big data analytics, even though they're using an Excel spreadsheet to, to find the trends? I'm not real wild about, you know, goofy names and things like that. It's more of a case of what are you doing with it and how big a data set are you doing? Remember, the PC came into the corporate world through the back door because people were tired of having to wait on the big boys to do their thing with data. Remember, it was SuperCalc that first came in the door. It was spreadsheets. Being able to do analytics on the data that they had already. So I, I should also point out that there are add-ins and snap-ons for Excel that do absolutely amazing things. You can set it up in Excel and then run amazing statistical analysis in SAS, in MATLAB, in SPSS, all starting from humble Excel. So you can do an awful lot, and I, I applaud them. Why would you want to spend an amazing amount of money on a tool, you know, especially time and money, 
when Excel can do it just fine. It's funny because we've got Elise in the chat room who's saying Excel is not a big data set. It's not a big data tool. And that's that's what kind of got me puzzled about this because I thought, okay, yeah, this is this is an absolute case study for how to use big data. But then when they got to the part where they're saying, oh, yeah, and they're using Excel and SQL, I'm thinking, no, wait, you can't do that. But if I look at the data sets, they're using hundreds of thousands of devices. That's hundreds of thousands of data points across networks from 15 different locations. That is That is big data. It's just they're not using what we thought were big data tools. So I, I think this is this is where it gets interesting when we're starting to sort of break up what we think big big data is and how you do the analytics. Uh, Chibert, I, I want to give you some uh, somewhat the same question that I gave to Curtis. Casinos obviously can't change the odds of their machines in real time. That's illegal. But one of the things that they're using with the big data, as I mentioned before, is using security cameras, using data that they're getting from the machines. They can figure out when a player has just about had it, and then they can reward the player. They can send someone over there and say, hey, we'd like to comp you a room, or we'd like to, here, here's a free drink, and you keep them playing. Now, my initial reaction was, I don't like that, because that seems like they're using big data to take advantage of people who are kind of addicted to gambling as it is. But this is the exact kind of analytics that you would be getting on Amazon. Have you ever wondered why the product that you were looking for three weeks ago suddenly shows up in a search result and in a banner ad? It's because they've someone has used a big data analytics tool to figure out that, well, he's starting to he's starting to search for the same item on different retailers. This is a good time to hit him again. This was the promise of big data, right? This this is the efficiency that it gives to companies. And it's not that different. You know, keep in mind that grocery stores like Safeway and Big Save, you know, all these different large chain uh, stores, they purposely rearrange the aisles. They purposely put things at the checkout stand and they watch what you buy so that when they kick out coupons, they go and try and say, well, this, you know, Mrs. Smith is buying this brand of ice cream, but let's see if we give her enough of a discount, will she go and buy the premium ice cream? Um, this kind of thing has been going on forever and ever. It's just that the tools are getting better. And yeah, I actually kind of like that. When I go and do search, I actually purposely go and do searches um, while I'm watching TV or whatever because I want to see what the big data analysis comes back on. What kind of deep pocket discounts are they going to give me on the stuff that I'm thinking about buying? And I actually try to game the system and see if I can generate coupons and discounts um, just because. Actually, I, I will confess to doing the same game. One of the things that I look for is if I'm if I'm searching the web and suddenly I get ads for things I'm interested in. The, my first thought is, oh, how did they how did they figure that out? Now I'll look back through my history. I'll look at my cookies and try to figure out what were the, the little metrics, the little bits of data that they were picking up on that made them think now was the time to pitch that to me. And it's it's actually a fascinating way to look at how you're being looked at, but. Curtis, let me ask you this. We're okay with big data when we think it's giving us an advantage, when we think it's giving us something tangible, like coupons. If big data can make the supermarket issue me coupons for things that I'm probably going to need, I appreciate that because it means I'm going to save money the next time I go shopping. But if if I suddenly, suddenly start to look at my gambling experience and say, well, big data is now helping the company that I'm giving money to take more of my money, it stops being something I want and it starts being something where I'm looking at it going, that's not fair. True, but let's let's think about this. I, I'm not sure that any rational person goes to Las Vegas saying, I'm going to go because I have an advantage over the casino. Whoa, 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 whoa. The last time I went to Vegas, we won big money. Okay, I just want to put that, well, like 90 bucks, but that's big money for me. Well, welcome to the psychological component of why gambling can be addictive. Exactly. Um, and basically what they're doing, people who go to Las Vegas to gamble tend to go to get that particular pleasure center in their brain scratched by the, the magical rewards that come along. And if I read this correctly, what they're doing is playing with those rewards. When it looks like you're just about to give up, they'll reward you. So, it, you know, in a different context, another little kibble treat will roll out of the slot machine 
to reward you for being there and enable you to stay there longer. Now, are you going to spend more money? Probably so. But have you had that pleasure center in your brain stimulated? Probably so. Um, within the context of gambling, I don't know that this is a problem leaving aside those people who have gambling addiction issues. That, that's a separate discussion. But by and large, if you think of this as entertainment, as the gaming industry would have you think of it, then it's just another way to bring pleasure to the entirety of the gaming experience. Exactly. And that's it's true. You, no one should be going to Vegas or any casino thinking they're going to win your go because you enjoy gambling. But that's that's in another show. Actually, we've it's got Lawn Dog and Chicken Head who are both talking about gambling. Lawn Dog is saying, we all know that person who thinks they have the system figured out and they know exactly how to win on slots and what to look for, et cetera, et cetera. They've got a system that wins every time. Uh, Chicken Head says he lives in Vegas, but he never gambles. I'm kind of the same way. Um, I, I will say this before we move on to the, the, the next topic. If there's a member of the Twyat Riot who works with a casino who would like to be on the show, I would love, I think we all three of us would love to have a conversation about what goes on. What kind of analytics do you use in a place like a casino, like a gambling establishment that uh, maybe might be good for the rest of the enterprise world to know about. Let's go ahead and move on to the next story. Achiever, let me ask you something. One of the things that we've said a lot on This Week in Enterprise Tech is you don't put anything in the, into the cloud that you're not comfortable with everyone seeing, right? It's We consider it kind of a public place. In fact, we've had a very good conversation about what you should do with your sensitive data, a, a la Sony, you take it offline, you take it near line, you make sure that you can't hack your way into it. Maybe you, you could social engineer your way into it, but you make it difficult enough so that your most crucial mission sensitive information is safe from the internet, from the cloud. So what would you say if I told you that you should put all of your financials into a cloud service? I would say maybe you might want to rethink that or at least go and make sure you've, you're working with a service or a system that is relatively safe. I will store my tax information in a cloud, but I do that in an encrypted file. And obviously the crickets agree with me. <laughs> I, I love the fact that that's going on right now. <laughs> yeah, two, two guys warning. just walked in with a um, DB meter they're measuring how loud this stupid alarm is. But you yeah, know, um, actually, that I, that, that high LPR forty is really good because it's it's loud, but it's not that loud. Yeah, well, I'm glad I got earplugs in. But anyway, to to the question is, I don't think we can go on in this modern world without having some kinds of um, you know sensitive data of one sort or another in the cloud. I think it's all about risk management, which is the title of this enterprise bite. How much are we willing to risk? Um, I'll do things like encrypt my data. I'll do things like purposely change my um, birthday uh, you know, in different ways uh, if I can. I will change the middle initial so at least I know where it came from. Uh, but I've kind of gotten to the point where, yeah, I'm going to have to deal with it now it's just a matter of, okay, maybe I should brush up on my life lock, make sure that I've got my documentation in order, and I'm just going to have to bite the boat because I can't get away from the cloud. It's going to, it's going to happen. It's got to happen. I just got to go and balance it so that I minimize my risk online. Exactly. And Curtis, I want to throw over to you because it is risk management, as Chibert said. Liz Herbert, who is a VP and a analyst at Forrester, um, at, at a conference for financial companies actually said, look, this idea of offline or nearline for your financials in an enterprise is actually just a myth because most enterprises are going to be outsourcing that to some sort of financial company. And that financial company, nine times out of 10, is using something in the cloud. So even if you think you're being secure by keeping everything on premise in house, Chances are, unless you are a complete one-stop shop and you have every employee that you need for the running of your enterprise inside the actual enterprise, it's going to be in the cloud in one way or another. Would you agree with that assessment? 
I think in the modern sense, absolutely. It, it, you're going to be looking far and wide to find any individual companies that have none of their infrastructure in the cloud. Uh, most of what we're hearing about are, are hybrid clouds. Now, it's going to be rare indeed to find an enterprise of any size that has its entire infrastructure in a single cloud. But what you find is that companies are using a number of different clouds, typically associated with different applications, um, as well as some storage on premises. Uh, the interesting thing to me when we look at this is that the cloud companies have for a number of years been talking about cloud storage as analogous to a bank. I mean, if you've got a million dollars in cash, would you consider it safer sitting in your living room or sitting in a bank somewhere? Now, most of us would take a million dollars to the bank because the bank has all of the systems in place to deal with securing cash in large amounts and making sure that it's retrievable, even though the individual dollar bills or $10 bills or $100 bills, whatever, that you take to the bank will be dispersed almost immediately. All of this is very similar to the cloud. Their point is that cloud companies are used to dealing with the large security issues, so they should be allowed to do that. Now, before you give them your data, you should plan to encrypt it. You should ask them if they are doing additional encryption on top of your encryption. Ask the questions, do the due diligence. But the fact is that the big cloud companies, and let, let's you know say that we're talking about companies like Microsoft, IBM, Google, Amazon, they're pretty good with their security. It's time to let them do that job. Just make sure that they know how seriously you take security so that they can be appropriately secure with your data. We've actually got Elise in the chat room who uh, is a data architect. And uh, she's saying that you can have a secure database in the cloud as long as you keep the data and the ID key separate. And that's actually something that we've seen. You know, you can steal the encrypted hash. It's really not going to do you any good. I, I think that's that's actually what we're going for. That's that's a very good point. Now, I do want to get back to Liz Herbert because Liz Herbert, again, this is the Forrester analyst who was speaking at the Hubble Up conference for financial companies. She was specifically speaking about ERP, enterprise resource planning. And this is something that anyone who's doing IT in an enterprise eventually has to go through. And she was saying, as you're doing enterprise resource planning, there's three things that you need to consider. These were the three major points from that Hubble Up conference. And the first, as you mentioned, uh, Curtis, was that cloud vendors like Microsoft, Amazon, Google, Rackspace, they make a business out of understanding security. They make a business out of understanding regulatory guidelines. So you, they are, they're probably already considering things like Surbanes-Oxley, like HIPAA, like PCI compliance, whereas your in-house IT guy probably isn't. Now, that's really important if you're storing employee information and if you're storing financial information. The second thing is that in-house systems, as much as we like to think of them being kept behind a wall, are, are actually more insecure than what you would get out of a dedicated cloud services provider. Uh, it, I mean, if you think about it, your box is probably going to be something you know, over the counter. It's an off the shelf box. It's going to suffer from the same kind of vulnerabilities and exploits that you're going to find throughout the industry. Whereas the OS, the customer, uh, customer designed OSs that you're going to find from cloud services companies tend to be a bit more hardened. And the third thing is that vulnerabilities are patched automatically and very quickly for dedicated service providers versus what you may or may not get in your in-house IT. All of that adds up to this idea, which at first may sound insane, but actually makes sense of, yeah, your, your, your financial data, your most critical data is probably best stored with best practices in the cloud. Chebert, agree, disagree, uh, are we crazy? Uh, you know, it's one of those things that it depends on the situation. You know, I, I do agree that someone who is providing cloud services, someone that's providing uh, co-location services, 
um, because it's part of their business, is going to spend a lot more time and energy on this. Uh, going around universities, going around private sector companies, it's every single CFO, every single organization I've had to deal with, they've always been, how much can we afford? How much can we afford? Um, can we cut a corner here or there to save a few bucks and help with the bottom line? So I will totally agree with the statement that a cloud vendor like Rackspace or Amazon or Google is probably going to do a heck of a lot better job on security than just about anyone I've seen. I, I, I will even include some of the hospitals. I will even include some of the banks because they're more interested in the bottom line. Whereas the, the cloud provider, the security is the bottom line. Well, gentlemen, let, let's go ahead and move to a, a happier topic for now. Uh, specifically, I want to talk about Windows 10. Now, Windows 10 has been a, a bit of a puzzle for me. I really like what I've seen in the previews. I've been running it on two of my systems back in my lab. They've done a very good job of maintaining the functionality of the kernel of Windows 8 while kind of rolling back the interface to make it more acceptable to those who are using Windows 7. It is definitely more enterprise friendly. It is definitely easier as far as licensing and remote administration is concerned. But there's been a question that's been floating around ever since Microsoft made that huge misunderstood announcement at the very beginning of the Windows 10 development, public development cycle. And that is everybody gets Windows 10. Do you remember that, uh, uh, Curtis, when uh, uh, they, they basically said, oh yeah, if you, if we, we want to give Windows 10 free to everybody. Oh, I certainly remember that. And um, it's, it struck me as, at the time as being an odd statement um, because, as we all know, it was very easy to get into certain parts of the the evaluation program there at the beginning. Um, are they really going to give all those people legitimate copies of the license? Now, on the one hand, um, I think we can agree that in the grand scheme of Microsoft Global, that's not going to be huge numbers. On the other hand, companies like Microsoft really, truly hate setting precedents. And that's a really, really tough precedent to step away from once you've put it in place. Right. It's, it's been funny because that one misspoken phrase during the launch uh, really set off a storm of speculation uh, about what Microsoft's future strategy might be. Some people were saying, well, well yeah, it makes sense for them to give away the OS because they're not going to try to make money on the OS anymore. They're making money off of the services they're selling on top of the OS. They want to make money off of Office. They want to make money off of as-a-service services with Azure. Then you had others who were saying, no, that, that doesn't make sense. Of course, they're only going to make it available for Windows 7 and 8 users because those are the people they want to migrate over. There were others still who were saying they're going to give a, a, an easier license path for enterprises who finally want to upgrade those Windows XP machines. Uh, but as it turns out, we, we're getting, I, I, I'm not even going to call it the final word because I've heard so many final words that it's its not worth mentioning, that uh, we know anyone who's running Windows 7 or better will get Windows 10 for free. We know that if you are running the Microsoft Insider program, which, uh, which was the public beta, the testing for Windows 10, they will not give you a license. So they're not giving you an activated copy of Windows 10. But what they'll do is they will let you continue in the program. You will always be able to run public betas of Windows 10 as long as they're being released. They just won't ever be activated. Uh, that's a far cry from giving everyone a copy of Windows 10. But uh, Chibert, uh, it's if you're not already a member of, of the Windows Insider program, you should probably get in it if you even want to play with Windows 10, yes? I guess. Um I certainly will have to because you have to be running Windows 10 at the moment if you want to play with Windows 10 embedded. Um, so I'm going to be forced to do it. There's an awful lot of speculation on whether it's going to be worth doing it. And some uh, personally, I think the anyone running a legal copy of Windows 7 or better would get Windows 10 for free is probably a better policy because that's going to cause more people to do an upgrade than this mamby pamby wishy washy policy um my my advice to microsoft is hey you guys want windows 10 to be adopted why don't you go and do something like the server 2012 enterprise edition where you can hyper you know virtualize as many servers as will fit onto the physical server do the same thing for windows 10 
You know, if you want to be able to go and so sell those RDP licenses, you want to go and sell those SA licenses, you want to go and get more and more people to go to Windows 10, make it only available for Windows 10. I'll bet you a lot of corporations will start, you know, jumping over the line and go into VDI and buy large numbers of licenses. You know, Microsoft, come on. You need more carrots. And that original thing that you said where anyone running Windows 7 or better gets it free, that would have gotten a lot of people to move over. And right now, I couldn't care, really. Alon Dog is actually focusing on something that the enthusiast community has been scratching their head about for a while, which is you can get an ISO for a clean install of Windows 10. That's actually how I've done it. I haven't installed Windows 10 on top of Windows 8 machines. I've installed Windows 10 on clean, bare metal. That seems a little strange for a company that says only Windows 7 and Windows 8 users are going to get it. Uh, uh, I, I want to throw this to you, Curtis, because you, I think, you're, you're more of the Microsoft expert of the three of us. And one of the, the, the topics that you were going to talk about it is how Windows 10 is kind of giving Microsoft its cool back. I mean, aside from the missteps with whether or not people are going to get copies of it, it's, it's actually got people wanting an operating system for Microsoft. That hasn't happened for a while. You know, that's, that's very true. I, I have watched over the, the years uh, power users, uh, cool users, people in universities and various places go from Windows to the Macintosh. And, and there's, there's been this, this shifting of the balance. Um, but it looks like, judging from what I'm seeing and what I'm hearing, that people are actually getting excited about Windows 10. A lot of the Windows users who were kind of having to, do, to defend their continued use of Windows through the Vista and even Windows 7 eras, and, and let's admit that Windows 7 was, was a pretty darn good operating system, are now saying, look, my operating system does a lot of great things. It has features that I've been asking for, features that show that Microsoft has listened to users. And, oh, by the way, it has a path from some of those earlier versions into Windows 10 from a usability standpoint. That is huge news. Uh, and it also, the, the fact that we're talking about cool shows the nature of the way that the consumer market is having an impact on enterprise software. Enterprise IT guys, by and large, don't care about cool. They want functionality. They want manageability. They want the ability to, to keep systems up and running. It's their users who think about things being cool, and that comes from their personal use. So the users are seeing this as cool. The individual consumers are, frankly, the ones who care about whether they can update for free from the preview program, but it's making it much, much easier for the IT departments to contemplate doing full enterprise switches when they know that the users are going to be enthusiastic about following them in that direction. It's interesting. We've got uh, Chickenhead21 and Batman who are talking about Windows XP. Uh, specifically, well, what does Windows 10 do that Windows XP doesn't? Believe it or not, that's actually a question that I've gotten from people for, that I work with who are asking me why they would need to upgrade their XP machines. I mean, they don't even want to move to 7. And, uh, Chibert, I, 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 let me get your input on this. For me, personally, any installation that I do, I, I won't let them use Windows XP. It's an end-of-life system. I, I, I won't let them, t let, I won't l allow them to let any XP machine touch a network with computers that I actually care about. Yeah, but what about the U.S. Navy <laughs> their but they're paying for support. That's different. I mean, they yeah. they are going to get machines that get patched. Everyone else in the world has XP machines that will never be able to recover from another zero day exploit. Yeah, ever. exactly. And I like Windows Seven. I like you know Windows Eight didn't suck badly. Um, the little bit of play I've had with Windows Ten says, okay, that's a great one. I don't mind doing it for a new machine. Um, I'm not going to purposely downgrade to Windows Seven. I'm just going to go to Ten. Uh, but so far, as far as I'm concerned, Windows Ten isn't good enough 
to make me move off the Mac platform. In fact, I'm, I'm getting ready to go cut a purchase order, go and buy the new MacBook Pro. Uh, because as far as, you know, network professionals go, the MacBook is so much easier to do. Microsoft has tried to automate so many things that, you know, I'm kind of me, me. Um, so anyway, yeah, Windows 10, the, there's a lot of good things about it. I do totally agree. I'm, I'm not even going to, I still have XP licenses. I'm not going to use them. I won't put them on. I totally agree with that. Windows 7, I'm not even sure I'd use Windows 7 unless it's still there. Uh, new machines, Windows 10, sure. So I guess that kind of answers your question. I'm, I'm still sitting on the fence. I don't mind Windows 10, but I'm not going to go out of my way to put it on yet. All right. I actually, I think that that works pretty well for everyone. Let's go ahead and move on to the next story, which is actually a story that we covered in the blips. I, I did want to get uh, the, the, the opinion of the two of you. Specifically, I want to talk about the T-Mobile complaint about this new auction for 600 megahertz spectrum. It's, it's an 80 megahertz block within that low frequency spectrum. It's great spectrum. And we all know that the lower frequencies, they, they penetrate buildings better. They go over long distances better. And specifically, T-Mobile wants to use these frequencies for deployment over urban areas. Uh, we also know that the FCC has already come back and they, they've addressed the concerns of the T-Mobile CEO. And they've essentially said, we think the rules are fine as it is. We're reserving almost 50% of the spectrum for companies that are not AT&T and Verizon. And it wouldn't be fair for us to, to reserve another 10% of that spectrum or another 20% of that spectrum for companies that are not going to be able to match the bids of an AT&T and or Verizon. Now, let me throw this over to you first, Curtis, because this is starting to become strange. The FCC has made a um, ridiculous amount of money over the last year from the sale of Spectrum. Uh, and it's, it's been adding to their war chest, which they will need because they're going to get sued over net neutrality and this is how they're going to defend themselves. But does T-Mobile make a good point? Is, is this more than just one company whining saying, we want more for less money? Or is there actually something to be said about allocating more of the premium wireless space to carriers that are not already the number one or number two carrier in the country? I think that if the FCC is serious about competition in the marketplace, then they need to whack off a larger chunk of that spectrum and reserve it for smaller players. Uh, there is something, we'll call it interesting, about the possibility that the FCC must reserve a larger chunk for AT&T and Verizon so that it gets the money from the auction to defend itself from lawsuits by AT&T and Verizon. The, the, the circular nature of that uh, is awfully entertaining. But on a very basic level, if the FCC is serious about diversity within the marketplace in terms of the number of companies who are able to effectively play in the marketplace, then they really have no choice but to take a larger chunk of this and give, uh, make it available for the smaller companies. Right, right. Uh, actually, we've got a good comment in the chat room from Untoward who says, T-Mobile and Sprint need to deploy more towers, period, spectrum or not. They have frequencies that the others don't and huge holes in their coverage areas, which is all true. But this was actually to T-Mobile's point, which is the spectrum that T-Mobile and Sprint have been able to purchase in these auctions is not choice spectrum. They're actually high, high frequencies. They don't penetrate well. They don't propagate well. And so the deployment costs are significantly higher, especially for companies that don't already have as many points of, 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 uh, of presence as Verizon or, or AT&T. In other words, it, not only are those frequencies not good, but those frequencies would only be good if they were owned by AT&T and, and Verizon. Chebert, is it up to the FCC? Is it the job of the FCC to do carrier affirmative action? Should they be looking out for the small guy? I mean, it, we, I think we would all benefit if we had three or even four big carriers rather than two big carriers. But is that too much? Is, is, is that now taking it completely out of the hands of the market and saying we're going to artificially set up two companies to compete against the other two companies? You know, 
this is one of those things where I, I, I have opinions all over the place. I don't have a consistent opinion, but the opinion I do have is that Spectrum and carriers and so forth have such a huge, huge effect on the marketplace and what services, what new products, what new inventions come out that this almost should be handled, you know, at the, well, maybe not the executive level. I'm, I'm not sure I like the executive level. I'm not sure I really like Congress, but something like maybe the, you know, the Federal Reserve where they're, tink they're tinkering with the economy anyway um, controlling who gets what f spectrum really does have a giant effect. I personally would love to see um, a third alternative. I want to have, you know, say this, who gets the choice spectrum is tied to who's going to support the tiny virtual carriers. There's a Kickstarter with a tiny Arduino micro that has a 3G modem on it and they have a virtual carrier so that I can get two meg per month for $1.99. We're not going to see that from ATT. We're not going to see that from Verizon. The only people who are going to play are the guys in the GSM range, and that's pretty much T-Mobile. So maybe say, hey, you're going to go and provide more support to the tiny guys so you can support the Internet of Things. That's going to qualify you to get the choice spectrum. I think that's a pretty good third, op third option. What do you say? You know, we, we may don't even need to say, look, you have to support the tiny guy. We could say the auction, because you're a government agency and you're not, you're not selling this so that you can be a for-profit agency, since you are supposed to watch after the public good, remember, that was the whole idea of net neutrality. They're watching after the public good. What would be better for the long-term survival of the internet and the long-term benefit of the American people? If that's going to be your, your criteria for making decisions, then maybe the auction shouldn't be about who is going to provide the most money for your war chest. The criteria should be who is providing the most benefit for American consumers, for the people who are actually uh, using this wireless spectrum. And if you, if you did it in that way, T-Mobile has been doing absolutely fantastically well. I mean, they are the uncarrier for a reason. They're providing plans at price points that are far below anything that AT&T or Verizon can provide. They are providing, they're the ones who broke up the two-year contract. They made it no longer the norm. I mean, yes, you can get a two-year contract, but now because of T-Mobile, you can get a month to month, you can get a prepaid, you can get something that works better if you don't have the kind of money that you would need for an AT&T two-year contract. The, Curtis, does that make sense? I mean, I, they're, they're a public agency. It feels as if T-Mobile actually has has this right, right? I mean, it would be better knowing that AT&T and Verizon already have three quarters of this prime wireless real estate to, to have at least half, if not all, of this low-frequency spectrum to go to a potential third or fourth player. Oh, I tend to agree with that. Now, we should be aware that there will be others who make the argument that it is in the public interest for the FCC to maximize the, the revenue that comes in. I mean, budget deficits and operating expenses and all of that mean that the more money that comes in, the less that has to be taken in taxes from we the people. So you can see the argument on both sides, even if you don't agree with it. I tend to think that more diversity in the marketplace is the more compelling argument, but that tends to be because technology is where I live rather than tax policy. But yeah, but Curtis, it, it seems as if the money argument, that is so, so short-sighted. I mean, the money is great. It's awesome when you get $100 billion out of an auction. And you can use that, again, in the war chest or in, the ter in terms of the FCC. I can't remember how they divided up the last bit. But, yeah, some of it went to, to pay down the debt. Some of it went to an emergency fund. Some of it went into a legal fund. But that's all gone. Eventually, that's gone. I mean, if, if there's one thing our government can do, it's spend money. And eventually, that all goes away. But this idea of setting up a legacy where your agency created actual competition, and it would be one of the first times that a government agency actually created competition, that sounds like something that would be good for the American people in the very long term. You know, I tend to agree with you, and it's something that has precedent. I mean, look at what happened 
with the original broadcast television spectrum. Uh, the FCC auctioned it. Uh, there was, a lot of people uh, might not remember this, but originally uh, one of the license requirements was that every station had to document not only that they were broadcasting, but how their broadcasts were benefiting the public. There were things like a specific number of hours that had to be broadcast every week that were for the benefit of children, as an example. And you could go into any station, ask to see those documents. They had to show you. And as they came up for the renewal of their license, people from the public could go in and make public comments on whether or not the station had done a good job. So there is precedent for this sort of thing. It's just that the money involved at the dawn of the television age, uh, age was so small compared to what we're seeing now that a lot of people think that the rules should be much, much different. I don't agree. Yeah, and the funny thing is, even though we can look back at what those original broadcasters paid for their licenses and say, what were they thinking? I mean, my gosh, they sold trillions of dollars worth of spectrum for pennies. I almost feel as if, well, in 30, 40 years, are, is the next and the next and the next generation going to look at these sales and say, what were they thinking? They sold them for pennies on the dollar. Chiebert, what about it? I mean, my personal feeling, and I think Curtis is with, with me on this, is that the money is fleeting. The money is transitory. But the regulation that you can put into place to force them to use the spectrum for the good of the American people, that's the important thing. That's what you should go through. As many people in the chat room have pointed out, the American people actually own this spectrum. The FCC isn't selling something that's theirs. They're sell selling something on behalf of us for our benefit. Oh, you know, the, the definition of a consultant is telling you the time with your own watch, right? So, yeah, we're, sell the, we're selling what belongs to the general public. And the general public isn't getting the benefit that I, we all think we should be getting more benefit. I want to point out that the wired telco carriers have what's called universal access that they've been saddled with. And universal access has cost the wired telcos massive, massive amounts of money to make sure that even someone that, you know, all they had to really have is a residence. And if you were too poor to own a telephone, you apply for a universal access and you got a telephone because it was considered for the public good. You needed to have it for emergency services. Maybe we need to have something like that. We, I totally agree with Curtis. We need to have something in the proposals that is for the public good, something that's going to last uh, I would like to see better coverage, more coverage. The, the fact that you can be out in the middle of nowhere and everybody's been dependent upon their cell phones and can't call for help. The fact that we've had people die in the middle of nowhere uh, in a snowbank and they can't call for help. Why not go and say, hey, part of your spectrum is you're going to have to spend a billion dollars and you're going to have to start putting some spectrum available, you know, put towers available, even for the most remote areas, so that if someone is in danger, you know, one of the general public, they can call for help. I think that would be a good investment in America and would also help the Internet of Things. You know, and I got, like that idea. We've got Bacon Bacon in the chat room saying that this will be an election issue. The party that gets on board with this issue in a meaningful way will help their party. I would like to believe that, but I think this is why John Legary released all those videos because to us, to geeks, to people who are watching Twite or watching Twit TV, we get this. We understand this. We understand that this is important because we're talking about decisions that are going to affect generations upon generations that are just hungrier for mobile access, for wireless access. But I also think, and, and I want to get your, your input on this, guys, the, the you know, Joe Normal, the, the person who's not watching Twit TV all the time, the person who's not paying attention other than using their phone, using their mobile device, A, they don't really understand the issues behind this, and B, they don't care. I mean, right? I, I, am I wrong in, in thinking that? I, I feel so much apathy from anyone who's not an insider as to why this is, this is something that we should care about. Uh, all people care about is can they make a call? Do they get a dropped call? Um, 
does the sound quality suck? That's all they really care about. Ow. Curtis? Um, you know, I, I tend to agree. When when you start talking about the size of spectrum allocations, uh, you're pretty much guaranteed to watch the, the eyes glaze over on most audiences. Uh, people care about the function. They want their their calls to go through. They want their text to be delivered on time. And they want to be able to stream their cat videos without having pauses and buffering going on. If that happens, then most of them really couldn't care less about how the spectrum is allocated. Now, they care about cost, so they would love to see all that great performance at the lowest possible cost. It's just the mechanism for making that happen that becomes awfully insider baseball for most people. Uh, I don't know. I, just, I think I just depressed myself with all that you know what we're gonna we're gonna have to bring this back up let's get some spectrum experts up here we, we already have some wi-fi experts but i want someone from the industry just like we just made a call out from someone in the gaming industry i want someone who can speak intelligently and 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 debate the issues with us as to why spectrum should or should not be allocated for particular uses let's let's look for that on a future episode of this week at enterprise tech Gentlemen, I'm afraid I'm going to have to shut it down. Believe it or not, it has been an hour, an hour of discussing some of the, the most interesting, the most important stories in enterprise tech for the last week. Uh, let's tell the folks where they can find us. Chibert, let's start with you. When you're not dodging really, really loud fire alarms, where are you? Where, the, where can they find you? Well, I got a nice deep dark suntan in Kihei, Maui, and a big shout out to the Maui makers. Um, and a big shout out to the staff at Fat Daddy's Smokehouse that makes some amazing smoked brisket that I'm going to go back for the next time I'm on Maui. I am A-D-V-N-E-T-L-A-B at Twitter. Please follow me. I've actually been posting pictures of the uh, systems that I've been building. In fact, let's go and bring it up. And there it is. There we go. That is a poll. That is a pole. That's that is actually a big honking transformer. And we those goofy things down on the bottom between the th three vertical lines, those are power taps. Those are actually waterproof and they just clamp right on and allows us to tap the power and also run CT so we can measure the power. And we are going to measure the entire circuit on Maui to try and find out just how PV power moves around in the neighborhood. A true smart grid. Uh, actually, very cool project. I wonder if there's budget in the Twyatt budget for me to go out there and do a special. Oh, uh, Leo? <laughs> Lisa? Also, uh, absolutely indispensable part of the Twyatt team, Mr. Curtis Franklin. What is going on at Information Week Radio? Well, we got a lot of stuff coming up, although not so much next week. You know, uh, there's a holiday next week, so we're taking a week off to celebrate our nation's independence. But the month of July is when things really start getting cranking again. We've got a lot of great interop-related radio coming up. We have much more in terms of both Information Week Live and IT Life. It's going to be a great month. Check us out in the informationweek.com slash radio page to see hear all about it and see what's going to be coming up. In addition, I've got a great article up right now at Information Week on COBOL and the discussion around COBOL, especially the COBOL that you can run on Raspberry Pi and your iPhone uh, is really fascinating. Uh, people should come over, take a look, and if you remember COBOL, Join in the conversation. If you want to keep up with what I'm doing, you can follow me on Twitter at KG4GWA. Curtis, Gbert, always, always, always a pleasure. Of course, I also want to thank you. That's right, the person who just spent the last hour listening to the best dang enterprise podcast in the universe. That's according to nine out of 10 cell phone carriers. We want to do something for you. We want to make it easier for you to get this week at Enterprise Tech on your device of choice. If you go to our website, in fact, our brand new website at twit.tv slash twiet, you'll find our entire back catalog. But more importantly, you'll find a way to subscribe, to subscribe to the audio, subscribe to the video so that you can get the audio version on your iPhone so you can listen on your way to work. Or maybe you want the video version on your tablet or the high definition video on your laptop or your desktop so you can watch us 
when you get home. Well, just go to twit.tv slash quiet and you'll get all the options right there. Also, don't forget that you can follow me on Twitter, twitter.com slash PadreSJ. That's at PadreSJ. If you follow me there, you'll find out what we're going to be doing on every week of This Week in Enterprise Tech, as well as all the other shows that I do on the Twit TV network. And you'll be able to suggest guests and topics for future episodes. It's one of the things that we do because we love you. Don't forget that we do this show live every week at 1 o'clock p.m. Pacific, but 1 ish o'clock p.m. Pacific time at live.twit.tv. And as long as you're watching us live, why not jump into the chat room at irc.twit.tv? I see you right there, which means that you can ask me questions. You can give me remarks. I try to include you as much as possible because Twit TV is interactive. Finally, I want to thank everyone who makes this show possible, to Lisa and to Leo for letting us do This Week in Enterprise Tech, to Karsten, my super producer, and of course, to my TD extraordinaire, Zach, Eskimo Zach, could you tell the people where they can find you on the Twit TV network? Yeah, Padre, I'm uh, I'm not even gonna promote myself this time. <sighs> what? I don't know why I open. Oh, never mind. All right, that's Eskimo Zach. Follow him on Twitter, twittercom slash at Eskimo Zach or whatever it's gonna be. Until next time, I'm Father Robert Ballas here, and remember, if you want to know what's going on in the enterprise. Just keep twiet.